Sound Editions presents Dave Barry Turns 40 by Dave Barry. Read for you by the author. Dave Barry Turns 40. Well, it's finally happening. I'm talking about the long-predicted aging process. I see many signs of it in my own life. For example, I've become tremendously concerned about my gums. There was a time when I could go for decades without even thinking about my gums, but recently they've come to loom larger in my mind than the greenhouse effect. Also, young people I meet keep using the word mister, causing me to whirl around and look behind me, expecting to see somebody with whom I associate this title such as the Pope or Walter Cronkite, only to realize that these young people are talking to me. Also, if I attempt to throw a softball without carefully warming up, I have to wait until approximately the next presidential administration before I can attempt to do this again. Also, I find myself asking my son, in a solemn parental voice, the same profoundly stupid old fogey questions that my parents used to ask me, such as, Do you want to poke somebody's eye out? Of course, I'm not alone. Growing older is a major lifestyle trend, potentially even bigger than cable television. Millions of us, the entire legendary baby boom herd, are lunging toward middle age. The time has come for us to stop identifying with Wally and the Beave. We're now a lot closer to Ward and June. Somebody has to be the grown-ups, and now it's our turn. The problem is, I'm not sure we're ready. I've been hanging around with people roughly my age for the bulk of my life, and I frankly do not feel that as a group we have acquired the wisdom and maturity needed to run the world, or even necessarily power tools. Many of us, I'm convinced, only look like grown-ups. I'm alarmed at the prospects of somebody my age getting into the Oval Office, because I know that if I got in there, I'd probably be okay for the first few days, but then I'd do something to amuse myself, such as order the Marines to invade Philadelphia, or issue a proclamation honoring nasal discharge week. But the alarming truth is, people my age are taking over the government, along with almost everything else. And what's even more terrifying, I'm seeing more and more important jobs being done by people who are even younger than I am. The scariest example is doctors. If you wake up from a terrible accident to find yourself strapped down on your back in an operating room awaiting emergency surgery, and a person walks in who's about to open you up with a sharp implement and root around among your personal organs, you want this person to look as much as possible like Robert Young, right? Well, today, the odds are you're going to look up and see Sean Penn. And let's talk about airline pilots. I've long felt that if I'm going to risk my life and valuable carry-on belongings in a profoundly heavy machine going absurdly fast, way the hell up in the air over places such as Arkansas where I don't even know anybody, then I want whoever is operating this machine to be much older and more mature than I. But now I routinely get on planes where the entire flight crew looks like it's raising money for its class trip. I'm very nervous on these flights. I want the crew to leave the cockpit door open so I can make sure they're not using the navigational computer to play Death Blasters from Planet Doom. I'm not suggesting that anything can be done about this trend. I mean, we can't pass a law requiring, for example, that airline pilots always have to be older than we are. That would become a real problem once we started reaching, say, our 80s. The pilot would come on the intercom and say, This is your captain, and my name is, um, it's, um, my name is right on the tip of my tongue. No, the only solution is for us to face up to the fact that we're no longer the hope for the future. The hope for the future now consists of the kids who like to shave their heads and ride skateboards off the tops of buildings. We baby boomers are the hope for right now, and we're going to have to accept it. Which is why I made this tape. My goal is to explore all the ramifications, physiological, emotional, and social, of turning 40, in hopes that by improving our understanding and awareness of the true significance of this challenging and extremely important new phase in our lives, we will acquire, as countless generations have acquired before us, the wisdom, the vision, the maturity we need to assure our rightful responsibilities and obligations as the moral, intellectual, political, and spiritual leaders, and yes, caretakers, of this increasingly fragile planet. Then let's drink a bunch of beer and set off fireworks. 
One of the more traumatic aspects of reaching age 40 is the realization that you no longer have the same body you had when you were 21. I know I don't. Sometimes when I take a shower, I look down at my body and I want to scream, Hey, this isn't my body. This body belongs to Willard Scott. But this is perfectly natural. Screaming in the shower, I mean. Reaching age 40, however, is not natural. I base this statement on extensive scientific documentation in the form of a newspaper article I vaguely remember reading once, which stated that the life expectancy of human beings in the wild is about 35 years. Think about what that means. It means that if you were in the wild, even in the non-smoking section, by now you'd be worm chow. So we can clearly see that going past age 40 is basically an affront to nature, with exhibit A being the Gabor sisters. Nevertheless, we are living longer. Thanks to modern medical advances such as antibiotics, nasal spray, and Diet Coke, it's become quite routine for people in the civilized world to pass the age of 40, sometimes more than once. As a person reaching this milestone, you need to take the time to learn about the biological changes that are taking place within your body so that you'll be better able to understand and cope with the inevitable and completely natural elements of the aging process. The minor aches, pains, dental problems, intestinal malfunctions, muscle deterioration, emotional instability, memory lapses, hearing and vision loss, impotence, seizures, growths, prostate problems, greatly reduced limb function, massive coronary failure, death, and of course, painful hemorrhoidal swelling that make up this exciting adventure we call middle age. Is there anything you can do about all this? You're darn right there is. You can fight back. All you need is a little determination, a willingness to get out of that reclining lounge chair, climb into that sweatsuit, lace on those running shoes, stride out that front door, and hurl yourself in front of that municipal bus. No, wait, sorry, forget what I said. There's absolutely no need to become suicidally depressed about the fact that every organ in your body is headed straight down the biological toilet. There really are things you can do to keep your body looking healthy and youthful for years to come. But before I discuss these things, I want you to answer the following question honestly. Are you willing to make the hard sacrifices needed to be really healthy? Or are you the kind of shallow, irresponsible person who wants a purely cosmetic change, a quick and dirty surface gloss that may make you look young and healthy, but actually has no long-term value? Me too. A few people, and I see no reason why we should not beat them to death with sticks, manage to reach middle age with lean, slender bodies. But most of us, by the time we turn 40, contain large sectors of fatty tissue, living memorials to every high-calorie item we have ever consumed, every brownie, Milky Way, Chuckle, Eskimo Pie, and Twinkie, every single M&M. It's all still there. This is stupid, of course. In these days of modern refrigeration, there's no reason to use the human buttock as a food storage device. But your body is still convinced that you're going to need that fat someday that the only thing standing between you and starvation will be the stored fat from a ring ding you ate in second grade. Many of us are willing to consider extreme measures to become slimmer. I'm talking about liposuction. I bet that more than once, when nobody was around, you've grabbed a handful of your fat and wished something truly ridiculous, something like, I wish some doctor would just stick a tube into my body and turn on a pump and suck this fat right out. Ha <laughs> ha! What a wacky idea. Do you honestly think, with all the serious medical problems confronting the human race, that a physician, a person who has gone through long, grueling years of medical training in order to acquire the vital healing skills that could be used to make a real difference in the lives of suffering people, do you honestly think that such a person would use this precious ability to suck bacon cheeseburgers out of your thighs? Well, certainly not for free. No, sir, it could run you more than a thousand buckaroos per thigh. This is not because the liposuction procedure is difficult. The procedure itself could be performed flawlessly by anyone who has completed the basic training course at Roto-Rooter. What makes it expensive is the problem of what to do with your fat. Think about it. You know from personal experience that your fat is the most malevolent, indestructible substance on the planet. There is no way to kill it. You've tried starving it, stretching it, cursing at it, pummeling it, and squeezing it into foundation garments, yet nothing has had the slightest effect. So it is very tough, 
and it's also going to be very angry that it has been unceremoniously sucked out of your body. The liposuction clinic cannot simply throw this dangerous substance into the garbage can. It would escape and follow you home. For this reason, every liposuction clinic is required to maintain, at great expense, a maximum security fat prison, where the contents removed from patients are incarcerated under 24-hour armed guard. Unfortunately, as liposuction becomes increasingly popular, these facilities have become more and more overcrowded, and unless something is done soon, we're going to see a tragic incident wherein a medical professional building is rocked by the unmistakable sound, sploosh of high-pressure liposuction byproducts exploding through steel doors, followed by the dreaded revenge-seeking wall of fat surging down once quiet suburban streets and engulfing innocent civilians. Other than that, there are few side effects. Another very popular form of anti-aging cosmetic surgery is, of course, the facelift. This is the procedure wherein the plastic surgeon perks up your face by standing behind you pulling your skin back on both sides of your head until the front is nice and tight, and then attaching the flaps of excess skin to the back of your head with the staple gun. Sure, it stings, but the visual effect is stunning, as you are miraculously transformed from a person with bags and wrinkles into a person whose eyes appear to be just slightly too far apart. In fact, if you get repeated facelifts, your eyes will gradually migrate around to the side of your head, carp-like, and you will experience a real bonus in the peripheral vision department. But these are only two of the many cosmetic surgery possibilities. Great strides forward are being made in this exciting field as the medical community becomes increasingly aware of the benefits, both psychological and physical, of getting rich. One popular new technique is called lipografting, or fat recycling, wherein fat cells are removed from one part of your body that is too large, such as your buttocks, and inject it into an area where you wish to have added fullness, such as your lips. People will then be literally kissing your ass. Ha <laughs> ha! Well, that was just a small example of lipografting humor to give you a sense of the happy, upbeat spirit that pervades this fast-growing field. And the best is yet to come. Someday, within your lifetime, it may be possible for a plastic surgeon to attach a tube to you and, using a very powerful pump, slurp up your entire body and replace it with that of a scientifically selected teenager. Of course, this would raise certain serious ethical questions, such as how many exemptions you should claim on your income tax. But I'm confident that we will one day be able to solve problems like this, which is a lot more than I can say for the problem of male pattern baldness. Let me begin this very sensitive discussion by stating that I see nothing funny about baldness. The fact that I, personally, have reached my 40s without any significant hair loss does not mean that I have the right to make insensitive remarks about those of you whose heads are turning into mosquito landing zones. If you're really bothered by your hair loss, there are various techniques that you can employ to combat it. And although these techniques vary greatly in cost and degree of medical risk, each of them, if used correctly, can enable the man who's getting a little thin on top to turn himself into a man who looks silly. The method preferred by most balding men for making themselves look silly is called the comb-over, which is when the man grows his hair on one side of his head very long and combs it across the bald area, creating an effect that looks very realistic and natural to observers who have been blind since birth. To everyone else, it looks like hair being combed over a bald area, which is usually clearly visible through the hair strands, so that from the top, the head looks like an egg in the grasp of a large tropical spider. Comb-over users with large balding areas have to get their hair from far down on the sides of their heads, which means they must part their hair comically low, sometimes around the ear. You'll see men who are basically trying to cover their entire skulls with one gigantic sideburn from hell. It's definitely an eye-catching look, men. Trust me. Another option, of course, is to wear a hairpiece. Famous actor and stud muffin Burt Reynolds wears one, and he looks terrific. There's no reason why you can't do the same thing. Of course, when I say do the same thing, I mean wear Burt Reynolds' hairpiece. This is definitely your best bet, because Burt spends as much money for his hairpiece as most people spend on their dream retirement homes. A hairpiece that costs any less, the kind you could afford, for example, is inevitably going to make you look as though you have for some reason decided to glue a roadkill to your scalp. Which is not entirely a bad thing. 
Ludicrously obvious hair pieces serve as an important source of harmless entertainment for society in general. Now to the topic of teeth. But what teeth? That's the question. Oh, sure, it looks like you have teeth, but in fact, the dental profession, working gradually so you would not notice, has, over the years, ground large sectors of your natural teeth into powder, which you then obligingly spit down the little dental toilet. Your mouth is now a whole menagerie of tooth-like objects and dental contraptions installed at various times, dating back to the Eisenhower administration. This wasn't supposed to happen to us. We were the generation that had fluoride, the wonder ingredient in our water supply. We were the generation that was taught the importance of brushing after every meal and getting regular checkups and shrieking, look, mom, no cavities. We watched Colgate commercials where the little smiling tooth knocked out Mr. Tooth Decay. So for years, we brushed and brushed. And then one day, the dental profession announced that, sorry, there had been a mistake. The problem was not Mr. Tooth Decay. The problem was Mr. Tartar and his evil sidekick, Mr. Plack. And it didn't matter how much we brushed, because now we all had gum disease, the only treatment for which is to, surprise, grind additional teeth into powder. So now many of us have taken up flossing, wherein each night we savagely assault our own gum tissue and stagger off to bed with blood dribbling from our mouths, looking like losing boxers. But we know we're only fooling ourselves. We know that in a few years, the dental profession will announce that, sorry, the real problem is not tartar or plaque. The real problem is something called mouth scunge, and the only way to kill it is to heat your teeth to 1,700 degrees with a special home dental laser device after each meal. And even if you do that, it will probably be necessary to locate, via microscope, any of your remaining natural teeth and grind them into powder. In fact, as our lifespans increase, the dental profession will eventually run out of teeth and we'll have to start grinding away at our skulls. By the year 2010, the average person of your age who has received regular professional dental care will have a head the size of a walnut. One final piece of health advice for people turning 40. You should definitely schedule a thorough medical checkup. Notice I say schedule. I do not advise that you actually submit to a thorough medical checkup because when you reach age 40, the medical profession suddenly develops an intense interest in a bodily region that I will not name here, except to say that the procedure for examining it is so humiliating that even if the doctor says you're perfectly healthy, you'll probably want to kill yourself. One of the wonderful things about being a woman reaching middle age in the 1990s is that having grown up during the era of women's liberation, you do not foolishly allow yourself to be constrained by mindless, outdated, sexist, stereotypical notions of what beauty is. Right, women? You don't feel insecure about growing older. If you glance in the mirror and happen to notice that you've developed crow's feet formations the size of the Mekong River Delta, you just laugh gaily and say, Thank goodness I do not foolishly allow myself to be constrained by mindless, outdated, sexist, stereotypical motions. <laughs> because let's not kid ourselves. Modern women are no more free from stereotypical notions about beauty than modern men are free from the primal belief that if you let another male cut in front of you in traffic, this is proof that he has a larger penis. So let's be realistic. You still want to look good. This is not to say that you assign the same priority to mere physical appearance as to being an independent, fulfilled person. No, you assign a much higher priority to mere physical appearance on some occasions, such as when you're at the beach, idly pummeling your cellulite and wondering whether your varicose veins, if stretched end to end, would reach Japan. And suddenly you notice that your husband, who has been pretending to read page 13,462 of James Michener's recent blockbuster epic novel, Cleveland, is in fact ogling a 19-year-old Barbie-shaped woman wearing a bathing suit the size of a hospital identification bracelet. In situations like this, it's quite natural for you to feel insecure, to wonder if your husband secretly wishes that you had the body of a 19-year-old. Trust me, this is not the case. He secretly wishes that you had the body of a 16-year-old, the slime ball. I mean, exactly how does he think you got your current set of hips? You got them from bearing his children, that's how. You got them from undergoing pregnancies that lasted, according to your calculations, for as long as six years apiece, during which you were forced to bloat up like Ronda Rhinoceros through no fault of your own, 
because your body was seized by irresistible, eons-old hormonal instincts that compelled you to stop at the Dunkin' Donuts so often that they finally gave you a reserved parking space, and all so that your husband's unborn children would be supplied with their necessary daily nutritional input of Bavarian cream. Fortunately, thanks to the selfless, caring people who make up the cosmetics industry, it is now possible for you to remain surprisingly youthful looking for at least a little longer with no more of a daily investment in time and money than would be required to build a working steam locomotive by hand. The key, of course, is proper skin care. Your skin's number one enemy is Mr. Sun, whom we used to think of as a friend. Remember? Remember when you used to lie on the beach practically naked at high noon and shout, Take my body, Mr. Sun! Of course, we now realize, thanks to advances in scientific knowledge, that you were a moron. In terms of responsible skin care, you might as well have been scrubbing yourself with Brillo pads drenched in battery acid. Because all that time, Mr. Sun was bombarding you with tiny, vicious, invisible rays called ultraviolets that are slowly heating up the Earth to the point where they may ultimately destroy all life on the planet. And what is worse, they cause dry skin. It's up to you to deal with this problem. Step one is never to go out in the daylight. Your role model here is the vampire community, whose members keep their skin attractively smooth and waxy for thousands of years. I'm not suggesting here that you should live in some dank castle, sleeping in a coffin by day and venturing forth at night to drink human blood. Top dermatologists agree that there's no reason why you can't keep your coffin in your current home. The important thing is that you stay out of the sun. You shouldn't even look at the sun on television or stand in a room with bright wallpaper or hum here comes the sun unless you're wearing a layer of UV blocking cream thick enough to conceal a set of car keys in. But even if you take these precautions, your skin is eventually going to deteriorate. When you're young, your skin contains many natural fluids that make it smooth and supple. But as you age, Mother Nature takes these fluids away from you and gives them to undeserving teenagers. Cosmetic industry scientists tell us that within our lifetimes, there will be a separate skin care product for each individual pore, so that you'll need to add a gymnasium-sized skin care product storage facility to your home. And in order to be ready to leave for work at 8 a.m., you'll have to start working on your face by 6 p.m. the previous day. But such is the price of progress. Now it's time to turn to the midlife <gasps> marriage. There can be no doubt that the institution of marriage is in serious trouble in our society. Nowadays, when two people manage to reach their 50th wedding anniversary, it's considered a news event at least as important as the U.S. trade deficit. You'll see newspaper stories with charming photographs of the couple holding hands and heartwarming quotes about how, after all these years, they still, by gosh, have the hots for each other. How do they do it? What's their secret recipe for keeping the romance and spontaneity in their relationship after all those decades? The answer is senility. These people barely recognize each other. Every morning they wake up and look at each other and they think, who the heck is this? Novelty. That's what they have going for them. A feeling of something different. Oh, sure, you run a certain risk when you reach this level of obliviousness. If you attempt to go to the post office, there's always a chance that you'll wander off and wind up in Brazil. But that's a small price to pay for lasting romance. Chances are, however, that you're all too familiar with your spouse. Chances are you feel as though you've been involved with this person since at least the Paleolithic period. After a decade or so of marriage, you know everything about your spouse, every habit and opinion and twitch and tick and minor skin growth. This kind of intimate knowledge can be very handy in certain situations, such as when you're on a TV quiz show where the object is to identify your spouse from the sound of his or her chewing, but it tends to lower the passion level of a relationship. The question is, what can you do about this? How can you keep your marriage from going stale? Fortunately, there are some effective techniques you can use. Reliable, time-tested techniques that I will discuss just as soon as I think them up. While I'm doing that, it would be a good idea for you to take a scientific quiz for determining how bad your marriage is. 1. What do you and your spouse have in common? A. We have essentially the same moral values, political views, and aesthetic judgments. B. We both like Chinese food. 
See, we are both protein-based life forms. 2. You are most likely to share your true feelings with your spouse when you are feeling A. Love B. Anger C. Sodium pentothal 3. When you have a serious conversation with your spouse, the topic is most likely to be A. Your relationship and how you can make it better B. Your children and how you should rear them C. Your remote control and who gets to hold it 4. In the special, most secret, most private moments that you and your spouse share together, you call each other A. Darling B. Lust Machine C. Long Distance 5. When you and your spouse disagree, you generally try to resolve your differences via A. Discussion B. Argument C. Assault Rifle the correct scoring procedure is to give yourself a certain number of points for each answer, although quite frankly I think that a person in your particular marital situation ought to spend less time fooling around with some idiot quiz and more time lining up a good attorney. Or, if you're a real dreamer, you could always try putting the spark back into your marriage. Your best bet here is to leave the kids with your parents and take a second honeymoon, although under no circumstances should the man attempt to carry the woman across the threshold unless your idea of an intimate evening involves paramedics. But other than that, a second honeymoon is a terrific idea, a chance for the two of you to spend some time alone, away from the numbing grind of your daily domestic routine, with nothing to distract you from the days of pleasure and nights of passion, except possibly the phone call from your mother asking if there's a particular pediatric surgeon you generally go to, or should she just pick one on her own. Which brings us to our next topic on children as a leading cause of old age. If you're like most members of the baby boom generation, you decided somewhere along the line, probably after about four margaritas, to have children. This was inevitable. Mother Nature, in her infinite wisdom, has instilled within each of us a powerful biological instinct to reproduce. This is her way of assuring that the human race, come what may, will never have any disposable income. In this section, we'll examine some of the challenges that we face as parental units entering middle age, a time when we're coming to this somber realization that we will not always be there to guide and direct our children, which is just as well because this is also a time when our children are coming to the conclusion that we are unbelievable dorks. One big reason for this, of course, is our taste in music. I'm assuming that you're like most of us boomers in the sense that musically, you've always considered yourself to be a major hipster. Why not? Hey, we were the frontline troops in the rock and roll revolution, right? Damn straight. We were born to boogie. We grew up dancing the twist, the mashed potato, the boogaloo, the jerk, the watusi, the pony, the alligator, the clam, and the vicious blood-sucking insect. We knew the dirty words to Louie Louie, including the ones that didn't actually exist. We knew the Beach Boys when they could sing and Elvis when he was alive the first time. We knew the Beatles and the Stones when they were actual bands as opposed to multinational corporations. We defined hip. We set all kinds of world hipness records and we were sure they'd never be broken. By the 80s, a lot of radio stations, realizing the size of the market out there, had started playing 60s music again. They called it classic rock because they knew we'd be upset if they came right out and called it what it was, namely, middle-aged person nostalgia music. It's a very popular format now. And so, because we represent the world's largest consumer horde, we get to hear our music all the time. We're wrapped in a snug, warm cocoon of 60s-ness, and we actually think we're still with it. Whereas, in fact, we're nowhere near it. The light leaving from it right now will not reach us for several years. I've become intensely aware of this through my son, who, despite constant exposure to my taste in music, does not choose to listen to classic rock. When he's in control of the radio, he tunes into a different kind of music, a new kind of music, a now kind of music that can only be described, and I do not mean to be making any value judgments here, as stupid. If you have kids, you probably know the music I mean. It sounds as though an evil scientist had gone into his laboratory and for some insane reason combined disco with heavy metal. It has no melody and hardly any words. It consists almost entirely of bass notes registering 7.4 on the Richter scale. It's music to slaughter cattle by. 
This is the kind of music my son likes to listen to. This leads to conflict when we're in the car. He'll push the radio button for cattle slaughtering music, and then I, in a loving parental effort to guide him toward a more sophisticated and meaningful cultural experience, will thoughtfully swat his hand aside and push the button for classic rock. Then he'll lean back in his seat and look at me with exactly the same disgusted look I aimed at my parents 30 years ago when they made me take my Buddy Holly 45s off of our RCA phonograph so they could play Rosemary Clooney. Another area in which my son makes me feel old is fashion, especially hair fashion. I've always considered myself to be extremely liberal when it came to hair because I remember how much I hated the hair hassles I went through back in the 60s when I had long hair. I'd be walking past a clot of geezers who were sitting in front of the volunteer fire department, hoping somebody's house would catch fire so they could watch the trucks pull out. And one of them would invariably look at me and say, in a tone of voice suggesting that this was the cleverest and most original remark ever thought up by anybody with the possible exception of Mark Twain, Hey, is that a boy or a girl? <laughs> I, being a flower child peace person in the summer of love, would give them the finger. But I'd also vow to myself that no matter how old I got, I would never, ever hassle anybody about his haircut. For the first few years after my son was born, things were fairly frictionless on the haircut front. My son favored the Dwight Eisenhower style, so popular with babies, consisting of approximately eight wisps of hair occasionally festooned with cream spinach. Then one day, when he was six, he came home from school, which is where they pick this stuff up, and announced that he wanted a punk haircut. Remembering my experiences in the 60s, I sat him down and thoughtfully explained to him that although I personally did not care for the punk style of haircut, the real issue here was personal freedom of choice. And since it was, after all, his hair, then by gosh, if he really, really wanted to, he could get a punk haircut just as soon as I had been dead and buried for a minimum of 45 years. I thought that this honest sharing of feelings had settled the matter, so you can imagine my surprise when, about a week later, my son went to the mall with my wife, whom I will never fully trust again, and came home looking like Sid Vicious. His hair was very short around the sides, except for a little tail going down the back of his neck, as though the barber had suddenly remembered an important appointment and had to rush off without finishing my son. The hair on the top was smeared with what appeared to be transmission fluid and sticking up in spikes, which made it look like a marine creature striking a defensive posture. But I'll tell you what would really age me fast. If I had a teenage daughter, I don't think I could handle that, because that would mean that teenage boys would be coming around to my house. Hi, Mr. Barry, they'd say with their cheerful, innocent young voices. We're here to have sex with your daughter. No, of course they wouldn't come right out and say that, but I'd know that's what they'd be thinking, because I was a teenage boy once and basically I was a walking hormone storm. So in some ways I'm relieved that I don't have daughters, although in other ways I envy people with daughters, because little girls tend to be thoughtful, whereas little boys tend to be, and I say this as a loving father who would not trade his son for anything in the world, jerks. I used to think this was society's fault. That was back in the idealistic 60s and 70s when we boomers had many excellent child-rearing theories and no actual children. Remember when we truly believed that if society treated boys and girls exactly the same, then they wouldn't be bound by sexual stereotypes, and the boys would grow up to be sensitive and the girls would grow up to be linebackers? Ha! Boy, were we ever idealistic, by which I mean stupid. Because when we look at actual children, no matter how they are raised, we notice immediately that little girls are in fact smaller versions of real human beings, whereas little boys are pod people from the planet Destructo. In the pantheon of sports heroes, you'll find the names of many legendary athletes who remain active in sports well after they turn 40. Babe Ruth, Jack Dempsey, Picasso, Secretariat, the list goes on and on. What do these great competitors have in common? Right, they're all dead. So you see how important it is for you to slow down as you get older, to abandon the active sports you enjoyed so much in your youth. Basketball, tennis, racquetball, Drinking a quart of Jim Beam and leaping naked into the hotel pool from the 8th floor balcony? Time for you to start acting your age by getting involved in the kinds of sports that are more appropriate for mature, responsible adults, such as shrieking at little leaguers. 
To participate in this highly popular sport, all you need to do is get a small child who would be infinitely happier just staying home and playing in the dirt, and put a uniform on this child, and make him stand for hours out on a field with other reluctant children, who are no more capable of hitting or catching or accurately throwing a baseball than they are of performing neurosurgery. Then you and the other grown-ups stand around the perimeter and leap up and down and shriek at these children as though the fate of the human race depended on their actions. The object of the game is to activate your child if the ball goes near him, similar to the way you use levers to activate the little men in table hockey games. Your child will be standing out in right field, picking his nose, staring into space, totally oblivious to the game, and the ball will come rolling his way, and your job is to leap violently up and down and shriek, Get the ball! Get the ball! repeatedly for several minutes until your child finally is roused from his reveries long enough to glance down and discover, to his amazement, the ball. While your child is staring at the ball curiously, as if examining a large and unusual tropical insect, you switch to yelling, throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball. After several minutes of this, an idea will start to form somewhere deep inside your child's brain. Perhaps I should throw the ball. Yes, it's crazy, but it just might work. And so, seconds before you go into cardiac arrest on the sidelines, your child will pick up the ball and hurl it, Little League style, in a totally random direction, then resume picking his nose and staring off into space. As you collapse, exhausted, the ball will roll in the general direction of some other child whose poor, unfortunate parent must then try to activate him. Meanwhile, the other team's parents will be shrieking at their children to run around the bases in the correct direction. It's not uncommon for 150 runs to score in one Little League play. A single game can go on for weeks. Perhaps the fastest growing sport for the over 40 person is one that combines the advantages of a good cardiovascular workout with the advantages of looking like you have a bizarre disorder of the central nervous system. I refer to walking like a dork. This has become very popular among older people who used to jog for their health but could no longer afford the orthopedic surgery. The object of dork walking is to make a simple everyday act performed by millions of people every day, namely walking look as complex and strenuous as Olympic pole vaulting. To do this, you need to wear a special outfit, including high-tech, color-coordinated shorts and sweat clothes, and headbands and wristbands and a visor, and a Sony walk-person tape player, and little useless weights for your hands, and special dork-walking shoes that cost as much per pair as round-trip airfare to London. But the most important thing is your walking technique. You have to make your arms and legs as stiff as possible and swing them violently forward and back in an awkward, vaguely Richard Nixon-like manner. It helps a lot to have an enormous butt waving around back there like the Fuji blimp in a tornado. You'll know you're doing it right when passing motorists laugh so hard that they drive into trees. But as you age, you may find that even dork walking is too strenuous for you. In this case, you'll want to look into the ultimate aging person activity, a sport that requires so little physical activity that major tournaments are routinely won by coma victims. I refer, of course, to golf. Nobody knows exactly how golf got started. Probably what happened was thousands of years ago, a couple of primitive guys were standing around holding some odd-shaped sticks, and they noticed a golf ball lying on the grass, and they said, hey, let's see if we can hit this into a hole. And then they said, nah, let's just tell long, boring anecdotes about it instead. Which is basically the object in golf. You put on the most unattractive pants that money can buy. Pants so ugly that they have to be manufactured by blind people in dark rooms. And you get together in the clubhouse with other golfers and drone away for hours about how you bogeyed your three iron on the par six or your six iron on the par three or whatever. Also, you watch endless televised professional golf tournaments with names like the Buick Merrill Lynch Manufacturers Hanover Frito-Lay Tidy Bowl Preparation H Classic, which consists entirely of moderately overweight men holding clubs and frowning into the distance, while in the background, two announcers hold interminable whispered conversations. Fishing is very similar to golf because in both sports you hold a long skinny thing in your hand while nothing happens for days at a time. The major advantage of fishing is that you are somewhat less likely to be killed by a golf ball. 
The disadvantage is that you have to become involved with bait, which consists of disgusting little creatures with a substance known to biologists as bait glop, constantly oozing out of various orifices. The function of the bait is to be repulsive and thereby reduce the chances that a fish will bite it and wind up in your boat, thrashing and gasping piteously and occasionally whispering in a quiet but clear voice, Please help me! If you were to put a nice roast beef sandwich on your hook or an egg roll, you'd have fish coming from entirely different time zones to get caught. But not so with bait. He's so dumb he'd eat bait is a common fish expression, which means that the only fish you're in any danger of catching are the total morons of the marine community. If you're bored by slower activities and you're looking for the kind of youth recapturing action-packed sport that offers you the opportunity to potentially knock down a tree with your face, you can't do better than skiing. The key to a successful ski trip, of course, is planning, by which I mean money. For openers, you have to buy a special outfit that meets the strict requirements of the Ski Fashion Institute, namely, one, it must cost as much as a medium wedding reception, two, it must make you look like the giant radioactive Easter Bunny from space. Three, it must be made of a mutant fiber with a name that sounds like the villain on a Saturday morning cartoon show, such as Gore-Tex, so as to provide the necessary resistance to moisture, which, trust me, will be gushing violently from all of your major armpits once you start lunging down the mountain. You also have to buy ski goggles costing upwards of $50 per eyeball that are specially designed not to fog up under any circumstances except when you actually put them on, at which time they become approximately as transparent as the Los Angeles telephone directory. This is why veteran skiers recommend that you do not pull them down over your eyes until just before you make contact with the tree. And you'll need ski boots, which are made from melted bowling balls and which protect your feet by preventing your blood, which could contain dangerous germs, from traveling below your shins. As for the actual skis, you should rent them because of the feeling of confidence you get from reading the fine print on the lengthy legal document that the rental personnel make you sign. It's worded as follows. The undersigned agrees that skiing is an insanely dangerous activity and that the rental personnel were just sitting around minding their own business when the undersigned, who agrees that he or she is a raving loon, came barging in, uninvited, waving a loaded revolver, and demanding that he or she be given some rental skis for the express purpose of suffering serious injury or death, leaving the rental personnel with no choice but to... and so on. Okay, now you're ready to hit the slopes. Ski experts recommend that you start by taking a group lesson, because otherwise these ski experts would have to get real jobs. To start the lesson, your instructor, who's always a smiling 19-year-old named Chip, will take you to the top of the mountain and explain basic ski safety procedures until he feels that the cold has killed enough of your brain cells that you'll cheerfully follow whatever lunatic command he gives you. Then he'll ski a short distance down the mountain, just to the point where it gets very steep, and swoosh to a graceful stop, making it look absurdly easy. Of course, it is easy for Chip. He's wearing an anti-gravity device. When he stops, he turns to the group, his skis hovering as much as three inches above the ground, and orders the first student to copy what he did. This is the fun part. Woodland creatures often wake up from hibernation just to watch this part, because even they understand that the laws of physics, which are strictly enforced on the ski slopes, do not permit a person to simply stop on the side of a snow-covered mountain if his feet are encased in bowling balls attached to what are essentially large pieces of Teflon. Nevertheless, the first student, obeying Chip's command, cautiously pushes himself forward and then, making an unusual throat sound, passes Chip at warp speed and proceeds into the woods, flailing his arms like a volunteer in a highly questionable nerve gas experiment. If you stick with your lessons, you'll become an intermediate skier, which means you'll learn to fall before you reach the woods. That's where I am now, in stark contrast to my nine-year-old son, who has not yet studied gravity in school and therefore became an expert in a number of hours. Watching him flash effortlessly down the slope, I experience, as a parent, feelings of both pride and hope. Pride in his accomplishment and hope that someday, somehow, He'll ski near enough to where I'm lying that I'll be able to trip him with my poles.
We'll now discuss the importance of financial planning for your retirement years. Your future standard of living depends on the investments you make today. If you fail to plan ahead, you could well spend your retirement years eating dumpster food and living under a highway overpass. Whereas if you heed my advice, you'll be able to spend your golden years in a modern, state-of-the-art appliance carton. The choice is yours. And let's not forget about financing your children's future educational needs. As you're no doubt aware, tuition costs have skyrocketed in recent years and are currently running as high as $15,000 and sometimes even $20,000 per semester, and that's for nursery school. College is even worse. And yet, as a concerned parent, you want to make sure that your child does receive the benefits of a college education to acquire the vital knowledge and skills that you acquired in college, such as how to take notes while sleeping or drink bourbon through your nose. Yes, you want your child to have these advantages, but how can you afford it? The only logical solution is to get yourself on a sensible investment program. Of course, I can't give you any specific investment advice without having detailed knowledge of your current financial situation. So let's start off by taking a close look at your investment portfolio. Let's see here. Hey, wait a minute. This isn't an investment portfolio. This is your fifth grade science project entitled How Worms Eat. Nice try, but you might as well admit it. You don't even have an investment portfolio. You have nothing to show for all the money you've earned over the past 20 years except a heavily mortgaged house, a car that you owe 27 more payments on, even though it's already showing symptoms of fatal transmission disease, numerous malfunctioning appliances, huge mounds of books you never read, records you never listen to, clothes you never wear, and membership cards to health clubs you never go to. So your financial situation is a mess. Okay, fine. The important thing is, don't be discouraged. There's no reason to get down on yourself just because you've been an unbelievable jerk. My advice would be to get yourself into a sound, stable, diversified, long-term investment program of betting on dog races. Unless, of course, you're more of a risk taker, in which case you should put your money into a savings and loan institution, which is kind of like a bank, except it has boards on the windows. Or, if you're a real gambler, you might want to consider investing in the stock market. The way this works is, you find yourself a reputable stockbroker, defined as a stockbroker who has not been indicted yet, and you give him your money. He keeps some for himself and uses the rest to buy you a stock that he got a hot tip on and recommends highly. Although, of course, he keeps his own personal money in a mayonnaise jar. Next, you spend a lot of time listening to radio and TV financial analysts who clearly have no idea what the stock market is going to do next, but are absolutely brilliant at coming up with creative explanations as to why it did whatever it just did. Stocks were off today sharply in response to rumors that the July unemployment figures have been eaten by goats. That kind of thing. Eventually, you start to notice that your can't-miss stock is not performing up to expectations, as is evidenced by the fact that the newspaper is now listing it on the comic pages. Finally, you tell your broker to sell it, which he does, taking another chunk of the proceeds for himself and paying the balance to you out of one of those bus driver-style change dispensers. Of course, no discussion of your financial future would be complete without some mention of the terrific retirement program dreamed up by the federal government. I refer, of course, to Social Security. The way this works is the government takes an ever larger chunk of money out of your paycheck and gives it to retired people, even the ones who already have a whole lot more money than you do and use their Social Security checks exclusively to purchase sun hats for their racehorses. But you continue to pay because you're a generous, caring person who does not wish to be thrown into jail. Also, you figure that someday you'll retire and you'll get back all the money you paid in. The flaw in this reasoning is that when our whole humongously oversized generation retires, there's going to be virtually no workforce left to support us. The government will be trying to suck billions of dollars every week out of an estimated 53 Burger King employees. It's not going to work. The whole Social Security system is going to come crashing down, and you're not going to get a nickel, which is okay because there won't be anything to buy anyway, once the greenhouse effect causes the polar ice caps to melt to the point where the shopping malls are patronized mainly by jellyfish, assuming that all life on the planet hasn't already been wiped out by toxic waste or nuclear war, which could of course break out at any moment, 
which is why I can't stress enough the importance of getting started today on your long-term financial planning. Me, I'm going to order some Chinese food. As you get older, you've probably noticed that you tend to forget things. You'll be talking with somebody at a party, and you'll know that you know this person, but no matter how hard you try, you can't remember his or her name. This can be very embarrassing, especially if he or she turns out to be your spouse. The first few times you commit this kind of faux pas, which literally means hors d'oeuvre, you tend to gloss it over. But eventually you start to worry, to wonder if maybe you could be coming down with what's-his-name's disease. Well, let me offer you these kind words of gentle reassurance. Don't be such a moron. The odds are that you're merely suffering from a very common middle-aged person condition known technically to the medical profession as having a brain cluttered up with useless crap left over from 30 years ago. For example, to this very day, I can remember the words and tune to an incredibly irritating song sung long ago by Annette Funicello called Pineapple Princess. I hated this song when it came out. I still hate this song. I favor the death penalty for whoever wrote it. So naturally, my brain has assigned it priority one status and placed it on a special easy access memory circuit which means that whenever I'm trying desperately to remember the name of the party hostess or how old I am, there's old Annette, yammering away in the forefront of my brain lobes. What can you do about this useless brain clutter? Unfortunately, the only known cure is a painful medical procedure wherein doctors drill a hole in your skull so stored up information can escape. If the patient is a middle-aged man, the doctors have to leap out of the way to avoid being hit by a high-pressure blast of numbers, such as the batting averages for the entire Toronto Blue Jays lineup for 1979, and all the other vital pieces of information that guys tend to remember in lieu of trivia such as the full names of their children. The main drawback with this procedure is that if the doctors don't plug up your skull hole in time, you can lose your entire brain contents and wind up as a pathetic, drooling cretin with no hope for meaningful employment outside of the state legislature. My central point in this final section is that, follow my logic carefully here, unless you die, you will continue to get older. Of course, we can't say exactly how old you're going to get without knowing certain scientific facts about you, such as your genetic makeup, your medical history, and your tendency to wager large sums of money with men named Snake. But if you pick up any current actuarial table and look at the average lifespan for a person of your particular age, sex, and weight, you'll realize that, statistically, you have to squint like hell to read the numbers. This proves that you're already older than you think. And it's just going to get worse because of a law discovered by Albert Einstein, the brilliant physicist who not only invented the white guy Afro haircut, but also discovered the theory of decade relativity, which states, quote, each decade goes exactly twice as fast as the decade before. This is why so much more seemed to happen in the 60s than in the 70s, and why your only truly enduring memory of the 80s, when all is said and done, will be Tammy Faye Baker. So now here we are in the 90s, which means that regardless of how many gallons of oil of Olay you smear on yourself, you're still going to start aging faster than a day-old bagel in a hot dumpster. You need to think about this. You need to decide how you're going to deal with the fact that you're becoming an older person. One way is to deny it. This is the Peter Pan approach, and it has a powerful appeal, although it can make a person look ridiculous. Oh, some people try to get away with it, the best example being the Rolling Stones. As I speak, the remaining non-deceased stones, some of whom were born during the Hundred Years' War, are still out there on tour, still rocking and rolling and putting on an electrifying act that reaches its exciting climax during Satisfaction, when drummer Charlie Watts hurls his dentures into the crowd. Another approach taken by millions of people is to age gracefully, to enjoy the serenity that the golden years can bring with their gifts of maturity and wisdom. Or you can turn into a crusty old fart. That's definitely my plan. I figure that one of the major advantages of getting old is that you're allowed, even expected, to be eccentric and crotchety and just generally weird. Why not take advantage of this? In fact, you might want to start practicing geezerhood right now. Here are some guidelines. Men should wear hats at all times, including in the bath. They should always have their top shirt button buttoned, but not necessarily all the lower ones. 
For a casual summer look, men should wear a comfort-inducing, armpit-revealing, sleeveless undershirt, Bermuda shorts, and, this is very important, black knee socks with wing-tipped shoes. Women should wear a house dress large enough to cover an actual house. It should always be the same one, and it should be worn everywhere, including to the beach and funerals. Women should also give their hair a very natural and pleasing look by dyeing it exactly the same color as a radioactive carrot. As far as driving is concerned, the geezer car should be as large as possible. If a fighter jet can't land on it, you don't want to drive it. If necessary, you should get two cars and have them welded together. You should grip the wheel tightly enough so that you cannot be detached from it without a surgical procedure, and you should sit way down in the seat so that you're looking directly ahead at the speedometer. You should select a speed in advance, 23 miles per hour is very popular, and drive this speed at all times, regardless of whether you're in your driveway or on the interstate. Always come to a full stop when you notice a potentially hazardous road condition, such as an intersection, or a store, or a sidewalk, or a tree. If you're planning to make a turn at any point during the trip, you should plan ahead by putting your blinker on as soon as you start the car. Never park the car without making a minimum of 17 turns. Announcing your intimate medical problems is an excellent way to make new friends, especially in restaurants. I can't eat that spicy food, you should announce to nobody in particular in a voice loud enough to direct military field operations. I got this armpit cyst the size of a regulation softball, and that spicy food plays hell with it. One time I was eating chili and bang, the damn thing exploded, and there was cyst contents flying everywhere. You had people diving under tables and, hey, hey, how come everybody's leaving? Can I have your egg roll? And here's a hint for dealing with your children and grandchildren. When they come to see you, spend the entire time complaining to them about how they never come to see you. And so on. You get the idea. The main thing is, don't be discreet. We baby boomers have never been a discreet generation, and I see no reason why we should fade quietly away just because we're getting old. Let's remember the words of that rock song from the 60s, the theme of our entire generation, the unforgettable song that spoke for all of us when it said, when it said, uh... And it said, geez, how the hell did that song go? This has been a Sound Editions presentation from Random House. Hope you have enjoyed this audio program. Another title by Dave Barry available on audio cassette from Random House is Dave Barry Slept Here, a sort of history of the United States, read by the author.